all the children, sometimes people say that I'm, I'm one of the ch- children. All the children in our church, all the children, men, I also serve as a pastor here. We want to make sure we thank our moms, our, all our ladies for being here. We want to tell you we honor you. Amen? We honor you. We encourage you. And, and we want to tell you that you did a good thing by being here at church on Mother's Day. Men, you also did a good thing for being here on Mother's Day. But ladies, please listen. Please receive this by the Spirit of God that you are loved. You're valued. Amen? Today on Mother's Day, as these families make their way back to their seats, today on Mother's Day, we, we know if, if we can all like be real, we know that Mother's Day is very special, right, for, for moms, right? But we also know that Mother's Day is a reminder of many difficulties as well. Not everybody celebrates Mother's Day with joy in their hearts in the same way as others. Some people are going through or have gone through extreme trials. And we as a church, uh, we join uh, the culture in celebrating Mother's Day because it's the day that all of our culture celebrates with, with happiness and excitement but at the same time, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we are pointing all ladies uh, to the hope that is found in Jesus, no matter what season they're in, right? And we don't just refer to moms as biological moms. We, we are called Christ Family Church because we believe to the fam- uh, that we belong to the family of God, right? Which means that every woman for us is a spiritual mom. I have women in my lives that, are, that have been there for me, bio, biological moms that have been there for me, as well as spiritual moms that through my walk have stepped in and I have felt God taking care of me, nurturing me, uh, nurturing his children through the spiritual moms that he provides his church. And so we celebrate all ladies today. For me, Mother's Day, is uh, it reminds me of this story that, that I grew up, you know, uh, uh, witnessing a part of um, as, a, as a middle school boy at my house. And I would like to know how many dog or cat people do we have in the house today? If you're a dog person, I see your hands. Okay, cat person? A few cat people. A few cat people. All right. Yesterday we went to the beach and we saw a cat person. There was a beach, a cat at the beach and a little crate, you know, at the beach. You know, only in Dade, is, I think is what we could say about that. Um, but me growing up, we, we, are, we are proud dog people, right? But for some reason, there was a time in my life that we had cats. We had different animals. We even had ferrets and hedgehogs and rabbits, all types of animals. But we did have cats. And uh, in, there was a cat that became pregnant, right? And we weren't going to you know, have her give birth in, in our house, you know, so we had a little shed in the front where we allowed the cat to go there. It was, it was outside, but, but still had her, its covering, right? And so the cat was out there, gave birth to the little kittens, and there was this one morning, it was the week of Mother's Day, right? It was a week of Mother's Day. It was like this epiphany for me. It was a week of Mother's Day that this this cat is there with little kittens and two huge dogs start approaching our house, the front of our house. I say, I mean huge dogs. One of them was a Rottweiler and one of them was a German Shepherd, right? And so I was afraid, right, for, for for the cat and her kittens because if, you know, they grab one of the cats, they can destroy the cat. But the cat came out of the shed and attacked those two dogs that had the dogs running for their lives with their tail between their legs. I couldn't believe the scene that I just saw. That these huge dogs were running from this cat. And it just came to me. And that's why I always remember this story. That God has made women, has made moms, has created moms with this biological or the capacity to carry a lot of weight to protect and fight for their children, right? Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with a mom. Like, I wouldn't mess with Ruthie if I tried to get, you know, between her and her son. 
We know of moms that have lifted cars, right, to save their children. We, we know moms that have protected their children from a fire to save them, you know, and they were all burnt be, because they, they, they're strong. They fight for their kids. Today we're going to read a passage of scripture of a mom that in the same way needs to protect her children. So we're talking about something that is not just what we see out in God's creation, but we have examples of this. And typically, for Mother's Day, I like to preach a message by using a mom within Scripture. Usually, or frequently, we've been in the New Testament. Today, I want to go to the Old Testament and use one of my favorite witnesses of a mom found in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And, uh, I mean, if you've got your Bibles or your devices, you can turn there. It also should be on the screen, but as we can see, the school here is doing an event, and a lot of it is covered there. So I'll read it. You can listen along or you can follow it along on your own Bibles. It says, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 says, One of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, has died. You know that your servant feared the Lord. It's important to remember. Now the creditor is coming to take my two children as his slaves. Elisha asked her, what can I do for you? Tell me what you have in your house. She said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go out and borrow empty containers from all your neighbors. Do not get just a few. Then go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour oil into all the containers. Set the full ones to one side and then she left. After she had shut the door behind her, her and her sons, they kept bringing her containers, and she kept pouring. And when they were full, she said to her, to her son, bring me another container. But he replied, there aren't any more. Then the oil stopped. And she went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt. You and your sons can live on the rest. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we do read this account uh, from your word, Lord, that it wouldn't be a distant historical account to read and be encouraged by uh, simply on a superficial level, God, but that it would connect to our hearts, Lord, that we would see and taste and receive, God, uh, your faithfulness, Lord, that you provide. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so breaking this story down a bit, uh, we can obviously see that there's a mom with her two sons uh, because her husband has passed, meaning he's not in the picture anymore. It says that he was one of the sons or of the community of the prophet. It doesn't mean he's a biological son of the pl prophets. It means like, like uh, euphemistically speaking that many of America's sons and daughters are are going out to war, or we hope that the sons and daughters of Christ's family grow up uh, to serve the Lord. So this is somebody we can say that is a part of like the ministry team. He's serving uh, as a part of the prophets, like a son of the prophets, and his family is there with them. But because he had passed and his family is left behind without any means of survival, his wife, a mom, is faced with an obvious trial. It's actually a crisis. It's, it's a hard circumstance. And this crisis, we can say, is producing the normal emotions that every woman here carries, every man here, every girl and boy carry these emotions. For example, we can assume she is filled with grief, confusion, that, that her, her husband has died. In her context, it was very hard for women to survive. They would hopefully have to remarry. So we can assume hopelessness and frustration. We also read that she is in debt. And the law permitted in their day that if you still had to pay off your debt, the debtor can come and take your children and have them work to pay off the debt like slaves. And so we would ask, okay, here's the story. What does this have to do with us? Well, this woman is carrying a level of emotional weight, anxiety, that every woman and every person in this place has either carried, 
has come into this service caring and you try to muster and fight your way through, but you're still carrying it. Or we know as, as we can read and we know throughout scripture that everyone at one point or another will carry. But I promise that even this small historical account in the word of God is meant to encourage us all on this Mother's Day. So here's a driving question we want to ask and we will answer it throughout uh, the rest of the message. What do I do when I'm faced with a trial? As I've already mentioned, we know, of course, that all people face challenges and crises of different kinds. Uh, we know that James chapter 1 verse 2 tells us that we ought to consider it joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials which means that we will face them. But the question is, what do I do when I face a trial? And so let's answer our question by looking at our trial or our crisis from the text. Ver, uh, verse 1, but chapter one, uh, point 1 says, I learned to develop a lifestyle of bringing my trials to God. Verse 1, notice how it says that the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha. And she explains then, my servant is dead and they're about to take my children to be slaves. Now, I know that at, the, at church you're supposed to hear that, right? You're supposed to hear, if you're going through something, if you're experiencing a trial, hey, take it to the Lord. I mean, what else am I supposed to say as a pastor? Right? Hey, bring your trial to God. And so I know it sounds overly simple and obvious, but the point is that we want to assure people actually apply this. That people do bring their trials to God because it's not typically, when the heat of the moment is at hand, it's not typically applied by many. This mom brings her trial to God when she goes to. Elisha. Why? Because during this time, Elisha is the, the main prophet of God for Israel. God's chief representative for his people. Prophets announce the word and will of God saying, thus says the Lord. We today obviously don't go to a prophet of Israel as our connection to God. But the principle is the same because we do go to our prophet, who is also king and a great high priest. Does anybody know who that is? Who is that? Okay, I'll give you a hint. He is the only mediator between God and man. Who is that? Jesus. We go to God because we have his living word and will. We have his son. But here's the question. Do you have the habit of bringing your problems or trials to him? Do you know how to bring your trials to Jesus? One thing I continue to learn about my faith in Jesus, please listen. One thing I struggle with, but I fight to continue to learn, is that my faith in Jesus is not good news for my eternal security alone. But my faith in Jesus is good news for my everyday life on earth. I speak Jesus. I need Jesus right now, today. And I'm really fighting hard to learn and apply this for my, myself because the truth is that a lot of us don't understand the spiritual freedom and access we have to go to Jesus every day of our lives. And listen, on top of that, there is spiritual warfare happening right now as we speak through deception from Satan to keep you and I from running and crying out to our great high priest found in Jesus. No, no, no. Don't go to Jesus. You do belong to God, but don't go to Jesus. Instead, let's go to these other options for you to find comfort in. It's what we are bent to do. And that's why we're fighting back against that spiritual deception. To learn that when I face tough times, 
in the heat of the moment, when my emotions are so out of whack that I'm about to lose control, I can build a habit of grace to take my trials to my mediator, to my intercessor of my faith. In the same way that this mom went to Elisha, we know that Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, was read at the beginning of the service, tells us that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are. In, in, in essence, what that is saying is that one that has carried the weight of temptation, of trial, of problems, of sin, carried the weight of it, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in times of need. So this mother cried out to Elisha, but how does a person cry out to God through Jesus Christ, our mediator today? And let's make this as practical as possible. This is how we go to Jesus, church. We pursue, one, his presence through the Holy Spirit. My mouth, uh, my words, you know, when we were singing that song, we're going to sing it at the end of the service again. Uh, I speak Jesus is called. I, I, I intentionally speak and cry out and worship the name of Jesus. Because I know that I am doing so in the presence of God. Through worship and prayer and access to the Spirit of God. And so moms, we can intercede for our children through and in the presence of God. And know that the final authority is in control over our children. In Christ, we have the access to do so confidently. And so the question is, do you seek or pursue the presence of God, the same presence that can bring comfort to a troubled heart? I'd like to know who we have in the audience. Um, anyone lately uh, experienced a heavy, a troubled heart over a circumstance? You can raise your hand. Anybody? Okay, uh, we could probably say half or everyone in here. Pursuing, coming to God by pursuing his presence, we know that we are pursuing the same presence that can bring comfort to a troubled heart. The presence that can bring peace to an angry heart. If I would have asked that question, I'd be the first one to raise my hand. Anyone been angry, bitter? over something and I would say man me <laughs> me the same holy presence that will melt away this is the presence the when well, we sang the song again I keep using the song as a reference but it says burn like a fire right it, that's the expression that it uses because the holy presence of God has the burning power to melt away my anxieties another way that we pursue or we go to God is by pursuing his promises through the word. And there's nothing more practical and tangible than when one pursues the promises of God found in the Bible, as we're doing so today. And how many times we are faced, uh, Marilyn and I are faced with real challenges, and the simple and practical solution is, what does the word have to say over this matter? What does the Bible have to say and sometimes people are looking, well, the Bible doesn't answer and doesn't solve my problem. But the Bible does, doesn't just want to speak into the problem. The Bible wants to remind us who we are in Christ in the middle of the problem. The Word also will show us what our attitude should be as we respond to the problem. But the solution, the, the, the Word of God comes when we pursue His promises in the word. And number three, we pursue his people. Because some will ask, but, 
but I don't understand what the word says, you know. I don't know what Deuteronomy chapter 17 is telling me, verses 1 through 13. So what you could do is say, okay, I'm going to call Pastor Jose, you know, who is a theologian. He's like a, he's like a street gangster theologian, but nevertheless, a theologian. And you can say, man, I'm struggling through this situation and I found in the word and I think that the Lord spoke to my heart. But can you help me understand what the Lord is saying? And you don't have to go to a pastor. The point is that we pursue God when we pursue his people. The third P. Right? We pursue his people. That God is present. That his hands and feet are manifested through the body of Christ through the local church in a tangible way. Of course, it will come with imperfections. It will come with messiness. But God's method, God's blessing for us here on earth where we can go to him. As we know, we were dedicating these babies before the presence of God. As a local church, we're doing so in blessing. And I don't go to church to just get advice for a situation. I go to church because it's at my church that the hands and feet, the voice of God is spoken to me. And that does sometimes come with wisdom or advice. But I'm here today with all of you because Jesus works through all of you. So going to Jesus, what that means is that through or in his presence, upon his promises, and with his people. I know that as, let's say, moms, you can surrender right now from having to think that you as a mom have to carry a load that you are not meant to carry in your own strength. When we come to God is to realize, I don't, I'm not meant to carry this in my own strength. Moms can learn where to get strength, not the one that I muster up, but strength the size of Jesus. To get courage the size of Jesus or with Jesus. That also means that, moms, you don't have to give up. Now, we do surrender in worship before Jesus. We surrender to Jesus. But we don't surrender to our trial. This mom could have said, there's nothing I could do. I give in. I give up. Take my children. Now, I don't really know many moms who would just give up. I mean, at least the moms that I know, they do not give up easily. <laughs> the grandmas that were up here that I've known for many years have gone through a lot. One of them is my mom. And I just know that those, these moms, they don't give up. But I think it's an encouragement to your heart to hear, moms, listen, God knows your trial and he says, don't give up. Like, I know you know I'm not going to, listen, God says, don't give up. And why? Because Jesus will walk that trial with you. Doesn't that encourage your heart today? To know that I don't have to give in or bow down to whatever's before me. I have a mediator. I have a great high priest. Now the Bible gives us this story not for us to read it and be like, oh, poor lady, you know, what she's going through in her situation. And then turn her into this victim. The Bible doesn't sugarcoat things. The Bible teaches that God-fearing people do face times of need. And those needs look differently for different families and different seasons. But from experience, we all know that trials do come. They will come. But how about we embrace these trials? If you've walked in with a trial, a problem, a circumstance today, and you embrace it as an opportunity to come close to Jesus like you've never done before. Like this problem that I'm in has the purpose of deepening my surrender to Jesus. 
to open up, to confess to him every compartment of my heart and tell Jesus of my limitations, of my shortcomings, of my struggles and my insecurities and find the greatest source of strength and hope in all the universe. You are here today in church to know that you are not alone in your trial. No matter how much we believe to ourselves throughout the day that we are somehow isolated victims, that no one understands, when I'm faced with a trial, I can bring my trials to God and find mercy in grace in my times of need. Number two, when I'm faced with a trial, I learn to trust God within my trial with what I already have. I'm going to read verse 2 again. It says, And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, Your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Church, I don't know if you at face value are getting the importance and power of this point and verse of, of what we're being shown here. This principle here says that I will not act toward my trials or let's say toward my trials with my children upon what I don't have or what I wish I should have done or have not done or carry from my past as a regret or what I wish I had that other moms or other parents have and now I covet and I, and I compare and I de develop a heart of bitterness and discontentment. I mean, and that's so prevalent in our culture today. Comparisons, exaggerations. I mean, everything that we see is an exaggeration. It's a facade. But we today can be encouraged to know that I can trust in God within my trials with what I, what I already and currently have. Should we strive the best or want the best for our kids? Of course, we see our kids as God's gifts and we want to do what's best for them. But we need to learn for ourselves and even pass down to our kids and even grandkids to be content, to be faithful with what I already have, with the season that I am currently in. And then ex ex expect that God will use this season, this jar of oil, and multiply it and provide for us. For moms in the room, I ask... What has God called you to do as a mom? You have your circumstances. You have your pressures. You have what you're going. What, has, what is God calling you to do as a mom? Some may answer, well, I can't because so-and-so and this has, you talk a lot. This, is, this has happened to me and, and I, I, need, I need something else to happen first. And, or if I, I simply feel stuck. I feel stuck because of my given circumstances. But what if? I learn to trust God within my trials with what I currently have or the season I'm currently in. I, I don't look to constantly if dad was more around or more so-and-so, if I would have more finances or would have had this other job or my upbringing would have been different. I bring all those struggles and insecurities and I, and I bring them to the feet of Jesus so that when we read in verse 2, again, Elisha asked her, what can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? She said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go out and borrow empty containers from all your neighbors. Do not get just a few. And I love that there. Do not, don't just get a few because we want to expect that if we believe God is a big, faithful God, let's get all the jars possible and expect that he's going to provide. Then go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour oil into all the containers. Set the full ones to one side. So we notice that the prophet replies to the mom, I know you have a need, but what do you already have? Well, all I have is this, this little jar of oil. And it's from the jar of oil that she already had where the grace and the blessing and the provision that she needed comes from. And how many times do we catch ourselves needing to stop and reflect to allow 
God to use what I already have, the season that I'm in, to be the very place where God reveals that I have everything in him. We have everything. It's, I mean, we see this throughout scripture over and over. Paul, please, is asking God, please remove this thorn in my flesh. And God reminds him, you've got an overflow of my grace pouring into you, which is all you need. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul wants to assure we all understand this by saying, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. God's good news for me is my provision in Christ for everyday life. And it works when I trust in him in a practical sense with what I already have, with the season I'm currently in. And of course, this is a reminder to all moms present here today, but it also serves as a reminder to every woman, man, and girl, and boy. In the case of this mom, more oil meant more provision, meeting her need. She could sell it, she could trade it, and, and get the money she needs to get her out of her mess. But all she had is one jar, and the one jar is not enough in the natural. The, the jar is not enough. So in her case, the godly instruction is to go to her neighbors and knock on their doors. And then the neighbor opens the door. Oh, man, I'm so sorry to hear. What happened uh, with your husband? Yeah, I know it's, it's been really tough. You know, but but can, can you help me with something, please? Please help me with... With a, a need that I have, of course, uh, you know, can I just, I just borrow an empty jar? An empty jar? For what? I don't know. I'm just trusting in God and believing that God is faithful and will provide. Because the other option that I have is to give up. That's the other option I have. But isn't it like God to display his glory and power Especially through our toughest times when we think or we think we've reached our limits. So that he could show us that with God there are no limits. And for many today, please listen. This jar of oil can be as simple as a commitment to change something small in your life. Change an attitude that you carry and that attitude is not just an attitude that you use to respond to your situations. That's the attitude that you use to control your situations. You want to control your circumstances with this attitude that ultimately is destructed, destructing toward yourself and to the people around you. And if you would just recognize this attitude of mine stinks. My jar of oil is to, to change it. For others, it could be to incorporate, incorporate more prayer. Again, something that you should hear at church, right? A pastor should say, hey, church, we ought to pray more. But understand that in the heat of the moment, when I'm at home and the church isn't looking, <laughs> except for Al and Naomi, right, that live across the street, And there's stuff coming out of my mouth, and it's hitting the fan. <laughs> and it's sinful stuff that I, I say, you know. When I could instead say, we need to take this to Jesus in prayer. I need to incorporate more prayer over this situation or circumstance that is, is not like a microwave instant solution, but something that we're carrying through and I could incorporate let's just seek prayer I mean at least from my experience pursuing God through the presence of the Holy Spirit by way of prayer changes everything it changes everything it's changed my life uh, there are other people here that a jar of oil can represent eliminating eliminating things that are not of God or repenting and fighting against sinful addictions or patterns or behaviors and it's like again you want to control stuff through those patterns and behaviors 
And what God is calling you to do, the instruction of the prophet of God by way of Jesus is repent and come to me. Now, if I were in your shoes, especially those in our church that uh, are more are more theologians, you know, they like to talk about passages of scripture and like to theologize them. You know, if I'm Pastor Jose, for example, I would ask, hey, Jonathan, man, are you like, are you sure this, this huge principle of trusting God with what I already have? I mean, you can base that off of this one small story from a woman that we don't even know her name and her small jar, jar of oil? Because the way I think, I don't like to take small stories out of context and turn them into one motivational principle to follow. I like to think systematically in these things throughout Scripture. I want to know that this is the way God works through and through. And I do think I can contend this accurately throughout all of Scripture, that a, that, that a person's life is forever changed when they learn to trust in His glory and His power with what I already have, with the season that I'm in. So that he takes the small things and displays his greatness. So for example, where? Where else do we see God's faithfulness with what I currently have? Well, when there was uh, business owners and their reputation was on the line. Their family was at the face of, 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 of embarrassment. Because they ran out of wine at a party. Jesus is like, okay, what do you, we have empty jars. Okay, I'm going to use that. Just fill them up with water. And, and with what they had, he turned the water into wine. When people are hungry, like most of us are here right now today, right now is, you're wanting for me to finish already. When people are hungry, people were hungry in, in Scripture, and there were 5,000 men plus their Wives and children, and none of them had anything to eat. Jesus asked, but what do you guys have? And we have nothing. And then here comes this small boy and says, well, I have two fish and five loaves of bread. And it's what, what he already had that Jesus used to feed the multitude. When King Saul wanted to defeat Goliath, and he puts on the armor on boy David kid David and he could barely walk he looks like a zombie trying to walk with that heavy armor that he can't carry and he's supposed to carry that big sword to defeat Goliath God stops that and says oh hold on a second you can't carry that in your own strength but what do you have well all I have is these stones here we know that the woman with the alabaster jar of oil and anoints Jesus it's it's what she had a, a, a woman that didn't have anything to clean Jesus' feet uses her hair and her tears and turn that gathering into the greatest worship service that we, could, that we could read about. We know that there's a woman that came to the temple and gave all she had and it was more than the rich people giving from their abundance. We know that there was a woman with the physical condition of bleeding for 12 years and her attitude was, if I can just but touch the hem of his garment. And she does. And all of a sudden, Jesus feels this, this power come from him and all his disciples are questioning. Of course, everybody's pushing up against you. No, 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 but I, I experienced someone's faith of a mustard seed that came to Jesus, came to me. And received grace through her healing in her time of need. There's so much more that we can say even throughout women in scripture. How Jesus or God himself took the humble, simple servant of Virgin Mary to carry the Savior of the world. All these are written throughout scripture to show us that with the simple faith of a mustard seed... We can tell mountains to move, and God is faithful to move them. But they are also written to remind us this great truth found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. That as we look and consider the birds of the sky, they don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet our Heavenly Father feeds them. Hey, moms in the room, I'll ask you, are you not worth more 
than they. So when I face a trial to close, I learn the lifestyle of bringing my trials to God. I must learn that because the world, and the world will, will swallow you up. The world will beat you up. But we've got a God that sits on a throne of grace over the world. And we have access to him. I learned to trust God within my trials with what I already have. This is the season that I'm in. And I will use this season to be the platform that God uses to demonstrate his glory. And number three, I trust in God or I face this trial trusting in God and learning the lifestyle of expecting that he will provide. That he will provide. Verse 5 to close says, After she had shut the door behind her and her sons, they kept bringing her containers and she kept pouring. When they were full, she said to her son, Bring me another container. But he replied, There aren't any more. Then the oil stopped. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt. You and your sons can live on the rest. Church, as we close, if you're around Christ's family long enough, you know that we don't simply take stories from the Bible and leave them as just historical stories of encouragement. But we point every story to Jesus. I'm going to say that again. Every story that we read is so it would point us to Jesus. This story is a foreshadow that points everyone to see and read of Elisha as a picture of how we get to come to Jesus. And listen, that oil that continues to flow is the same overflowing and anointing and filling oil of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. And obviously, this doesn't just apply to the moms in the room. They apply for all people, for all aspects of life. But let's focus, men that are here with me today, let's focus and pray for our ladies. Amen? All our ladies. Because uh, we've got to say this, and we've got to admit, I hope I'm not alone, guys. That here's the reality, and maybe, you know, ladies, you can either agree or disagree, but this is the way we see it. The reality is that men disappoint, <laughs> okay? If you haven't found out already, and if maybe you've been married long enough, your husband, your husband disappoints you. There are some men that really try. Many, there are men that try uh, to do the best that they can. I know I try to do the best that I can to be a husband and a father that is a source of blessing for my, my, my family. And, and praise, praise God that, that I'm doing okay. I hope. <laughs> huh? Yeah, you can ask Marilyn. I mean, she's still here. <laughs> but listen, um, I fail her so much every day. Here, here's the other reality. There are, there are ladies, there are women here today that actually men have been the cause of great pain in their lives. A lot of hurt, a lot of wounds. But as we point to Jesus and the filling of his Holy Spirit through the prophet Elisha and the anointing oil or the filling of the oil, please listen to this. Although men fail, Jesus will never fail you. Jesus will never fail you. His love for you never fails. His provision and Holy Spirit filling in your heart never fails. So I do ask you to surrender it all to him. That's why he is here. That's why he has come and died and paid the penalty for your sins. So you would surrender to him. But not just your sins. Jesus has died to pay for the penalty of the sins that have caused you pain and release you from them. He died and paid for the pain caused from the sins committed against you. 
So right now, once again, with what you already have in the current season that you're already in, would you trust in Jesus? And we know that society puts a lot of pressure on you, women, to be strong, to be fierce, to be independent, and to fight and to fight and to fight. Some of you are in certain jobs that you've got to constantly be fighting and fighting. And you know what? I would say that Jesus does want you to fight. But as I've done before, I did this for the first time at a youth service years ago. When there were people that were just tired and weary of the fight because they keep fighting with their fists up like that. In fact, I would like to see that. Can I see some of the ladies? Can you put up your fists like that? Can I see that? Man. <laughs> Fabs, I would not mess with your mom <laughs> with her fist like that. <laughs> but uh, this is the way Jesus is asking you to fight. Not like that. That's the way the world expects you to fight. But instead of closing your fists, just open them up like this and worship Jesus. That's how we fight. Right? As we, as we now sing and we sing the name of Jesus... Would it be a song of warfare, right, over all your circumstances, right? And you surrender to Jesus and you speak the name of Jesus over every addiction, over every darkness, over every trial, over everything that you're facing. We know that we've believed in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And if you belong to him, you've repented of your sins, you believe in Jesus for today. The prayer is that if you've never believed in Jesus, that you believe in him today. And if you've come and you believe in Jesus, you also then come and you follow him, right? And you bring to him your trials and your struggles and you just fight through the spiritual warfare that we have of worship, right? Not like that, but with your, with your hands open like that. Amen? So I'm going to ask, let's all stand up. Just a quick... Uh, prayer because I don't want to take too much time for you to pray on your on your own with your families with the people that you're with next to you and you just you just pray this song of, of worship okay